Good morning. Welcome to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Today we have a presentation by a dynamic duo who's going to talk to us about global health. But before that, a few announcements. First of all, I'm told that match day for the students is next week. I'm told it's Monday. Jen, is that correct? So I, that's going to be exciting. Uh, and I will remind again uh, everyone that those of you who have taken the time out of your busy schedules to uh, meet with our candidates, I, I really appreciate that very much. Um, I want to congratulate Roberto Boli, who may not be in the audience, but who's been asked by Circulation Research to extend his tenure as editor in chief of that prestigious journal for another five years. That's a lot of work, but we want our people to be uh, visible out there because uh, of the good work they do, but also because it's selfish. We want our people to make us highly visible, and we congratulate him for that. Jeff Kalin, I don't know if Jeff is here today, the chief of dermatology, was just nominated a president-elect of the board, uh, by the board of directors of the Association of Professors of Medicine. And last week, Joe Geriso, I think I'm pronouncing that correct, deliver the inaugural Kalen Lecture with the Dermatology Group. So if you see Jeff around, uh, just congratulate them. Just a few weeks ago, a new list of best doctors in America came out, and I want to congratulate Drs. Foltz, Winters, McLean, Kruger, McClave, Ramirez, Miller, Jacobs, Dwyer, Letterer, Klein, McLeish, Youssef, Paris, for being listed this year. Uh, so if somebody asks you, do you have best doctors? Of course we do, and many more that are not even listed. Um, today we're going to talk about global health, and I, and I wanted to give you a little perspective on this, uh, which I think they're going to do. I don't want to steal their thunder. But it's sort of interesting that on, on this day there was a record set, and it was a record set by Lieutenant Albert William Stevens and Captain Orville Anderson who set up on a helium balloon, they call it the Explorer II, and they went up into the stratosphere and they set up a record of reaching 72,393 feet, a record that remained for the next 21 years. Stevens was a very skilled aerial photographer. He was known as the first person to obtain a, photography, a photograph of the curvature of the Earth. He also took photographs of the moon shadow on the Earth during a, a, uh, a lunar eclipse. But I think what's important is think about the world at the time of these people and that photograph coming out and giving you a better perception of this globe and the people in it. Think about that time. In the 19th century, major discoveries in medicine and public health helped us influence our concept of global health. The cholera outbreak in Broad Street in 1854 began to create the beginnings of foundation of modern epidemiology. In 1880 and in 1882, the microorganisms responsible for malaria and tuberculosis were identified. In the 20th century, we started developing reagents that actually could cure people or even prevent disease, with in, including the BCG vaccine and penicillin in the 1920s. And there were important steps throughout these years. And then later on, culmination of this understanding of global nature in which we live it is the creation of the United Nations and the World Bank in 1945, right after World War II. And then in 1948, this group came together to develop the World Health Organization. And from there on, we began to understand this concept of global health today defined as the area of study, research, and practice that places priority on improving health and achieving equity in health for all people worldwide. And that's important. Why do we care? Because while we here worry about people smoking in Kentucky, people outside of Kentucky worry about obesity, and outside of this country worry about being shot by a bullet or by not having clean water for their children. So global health is for all, equity is for all, but you don't have to go outside of Louisville to engage in this process. And that's what this team is going to tell you today. And the team is formed by two people who you know, Julio Alberto. Julio Alberto Ramirez, who I won't say much because you know him well, our Division Chief for Infectious Diseases, joined us from La Plata, Argentina. I want to say that again, La Plata, Argentina. In 1987, became a fellow here, never left to our, uh, we were lucky about that, and became Division Director. And as I mentioned a few months ago, uh, received the President's Award from the European Respiratory Society for his effort in pneumonia, epidemiology, and so forth. And the, the other member of this dynamic duo is Ruth Carrico, 
who you have seen a lot about uh, from uh, in the past year. She joined us from the School of Public Health, and she obtained her nursing degree in Louisville, Kentucky. She went to Bellarmine University for her bachelor's in science, master's of arts in Webster uh, University in Missouri, went to California to get her doctor's in philosophy, and has become very well known for her work in the area of infectious diseases and epidemiology. And she's won a number of awards, but I want to mention that last in 2012, she received the Carol DeMille Achievement Award from the Association of Professionals in Infectious Control and Epidemiology. And she and Dr. Julio Ramirez and everybody else in IB came to me uh, last year to discuss about this initiative that I think is a way for a good department to begin to reach greatness through a number of initiatives that are start to spread our efforts beyond the walls of the city. Dr. Julio, why don't we start with you? Yes, let's go together. Yes. Thank you very much. Then, um, with Ruth, we are going to give you this uh, 40 minutes overview of our global health initiative that Dr. Roman mentioned started just recently here in the, in the Department of Medicine. Uh, and the idea is to give you some uh, principles of global health liberal definitions. Uh, expand in the in the introduction of Dr. Roman, and then um, I'm going to discuss this in uh, 10 minutes. Ruth is going to discuss some of our service and education that we are doing here in the Department of Medicine. I'm going to touch on research and finish with what we think are our next uh, steps. Uh, then, uh, in the area of of definitions um, of principles of global health, we usually uh, recognize that in medicine. Uh, we are uh, mostly uh, interested in the health of a particular individual uh, when we see the patient the clinic in the hospital. And we know that our colleagues in, in, the, in public health, uh, usually through epidemiology, they are working with the health of a population. Um, we understand this. Then uh, when we look at our populations, uh, something that we are doing a lot in the ID division is, for instance, looking at the population in the hospital setting. We know that uh, then in the hospital setting, we have our groups running the hospital epidemiology. Now, we say, well, what is the population? As you know, the uh, we discuss presentation of hospital epidemiology here a lot. We have the, in the hospital setting, we have the patients, we have the healthcare workers, we have the visitors. This is the population, and we have a hospital epidemiologist present in the audience. Uh, Dr. Arnold, that is the hospital epidemiology from the University Hospital. We have Dr. Nakamatsu, the hospital epidemiologist at the, at the VA, and we do epidemiology with this population. Now, you move outside of our hospital and into our uh, city, then um, in Jefferson County, you, then you address, the issues are addressed by the Louisville um, no, uh, Public Health Department, now Metro Public Health and, and Wellness. But this will be maintaining the health of our city. You recognize that when you go to the state, it's the state department in Frankfurt. And then um, we all recognize that the health of the country is all the epidemiologists at the CDC. Uh, already, uh, Dr. Roman mentioned that um, in 48, then we have what is the, the World Health Organization. And this is mostly looking at what at that point initially was called international health. Um, the problem with international health in the way that, that the, the initial, the World Health Organization, look at this, this was an idea that, okay, uh, we are doing the right thing here, and in this poor country, they have this infectious disease problem, and we are going to go there and help you to resolve your problem. This was the idea of, this is the idea of international health. I go there to help you. Let me tell you how to do it. Then is one country helping a different country. As he mentioned, this now evolved into a different concept, and the concept is that global health, then the problems, we start noticing that there are problems that cross nations. And this is why some people said uh, that global health started with the HIV epidemics, because with HIV, it becomes very clear that this is not a problem of a particular country. This is everybody's problem. But also, these are health problems that concern many countries, and then we are looking at the scope of the issue. This is also uh, important. And these are two components that make uh, what is a global health uh, problem. And it was already uh, alluded, then the definition of global health is, is evolving. When you look into the literature, there are a lot of 
people uh, completely what's going to be the definition, but this article on Lancet, it was already mentioned, a field of service, education, and research. With a priority in improving health and also achieving equity in health for all people worldwide. Then what we are seeing now is the concept that, that what we have here is also uh, in the same article, they discuss a synthesis of this would be the, the global epidemiology with the global clinician. Then we have in now, is, uh, then in, in, a, it's in some medical schools, they have the idea that you need to generate this new physician that is going to have the global epidemiology view, but at the same time is going to be able to go and treat the patient with a global health uh, issue. Um, then with this understanding of the, of the definition, what I want to uh, address is, uh, now if I want to say what are the most pressing global health issues we can have a long list. I decided to put the most important ones, or what, what we consider the most important ones, as infectious diseases and non-infectious diseases. Uh, in infectious diseases, then, would be uh, HIV AIDS. We all recognize this is an epidemic. This is, this is uh, again, is fulfill all the criteria for global uh, health. Uh, pneumonia and influenza is always at the top because pneumonia and influenza combined are the number one cause of infectious death globally, okay? And we've been saying this over and over, and you hear this from me a lot, because pneumonia and influenza combined is the number one cause of infectious death even in the United States, okay? And sometimes people, rec and then if you, look at, if you look at pneumonia and influenza, more patients die globally of pneumonia and influenza than HIV, tuberculosis, or even malaria. And this is the number one killer. The problem is that the problem with pneumonia is that pneumonia is caused by different organisms. Then you don't have a pathogen that you can blame, like an HIV virus or the plasmodium for malaria. Okay, um, hepatitis and mostly with hepatitis C, we know that this is the new global pandemic that is emerging. Hepatitis C, uh, the problem of malaria, the real disease, also very important, and then the issue of emerging infections. Uh, the possibility of avian influenza that may happen any time. The, the Middle East uh, Respiratory uh, Syndrome, these new coronaviruses, and the, the possibility of these pandemics. Uh, MDR bacteria, uh, we have presentations on now with certain bacteria, CRE and other bacteria that we reach now the post-antibiotic era. Um, these will be issues that have to do with global health. The non-infectious diseases uh, considerations, uh, maternal and child uh, health, and we know that in plenty of countries, in a lot of countries, if you are a healthy female, the number one cause of death is going to be pregnant and delivery. And this is, this is a big issue in global health. Uh, violence against women uh, and, and human trafficking is another uh, critical uh, issue. Uh, um, uh, malnutrition, uh, that really, these are uh, diseases of nutrition. Then you have, we have a, a problem of malnutrition, and then as was already alluded, we have a pandemic of obesity. We have both. And of course, malnutrition goes, we know that malnutrition produces um, essentially the person is immunocompromised, then all these things happen more with malnutrition. Injury uh, and trauma care. Injury, we know that, that if you travel uh, abroad, one of the primary causes of death is going to be a, an injury because mostly with, a, with accidents in, in the in road. Um, when you get into, if you go into jail in any country, including the United States, again, these are global health, um, one of the problems that your health is going to deteriorate and probably a lot of these things are waiting for you, you go to jail. Uh, then uh, this is also another global health uh, issue. And then the chronic diseases, because we know that, that um, Western lifestyle has been moving into other countries, mostly into the big cities, and with this, uh, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, and all these problems have been moving from, one, from developed countries to underdeveloped countries. Um, then these will be the primary health uh, conditions that we have in global health. Now, um, why is that um, this is also important uh, is because international travelers, immigrants, refugees, then we know that the population is moving, and this is one aspect of globalization. Some people say, well, globalization also helps us in this concept of global health. 
because now we are all interconnected and our health is also more and more interconnected. Um, with this uh, in mind, then another different consideration of global health is that if we look at the different perspectives, okay, I'm seeing one patient today in clinic. Then I, again, I, to, to deal with any one of these patients, in any one of these issues, as was already alluded, you will need to travel to another country. Any one of these issues we can present here in, uh, in Louisville. Uh, but then we have the medical approach that we look at the patient, we try to figure out what's wrong with the patient, we try to treat the patient. Uh, and we already discussed that there is the epidemiological approach looking at the, at the global issue here, looking at you know, Jefferson County uh, and figure out what can we do to maintain a healthy population uh, in Jefferson County. Now in global health, another aspect that are uh, critical is what is defined as the social determinants of health. Then we have all these social factors, starting with culture, um, no, ethnicity and, and the idea of how a person is going to see the world, the, the world vision, uh, spirituality and the consideration of religions and spirituality in health, social class, economic class and the consideration of this in health, the moral principles, political context, uh, and we've seen here, no, we've seen here, we used to have uh, until recently a torture clinic. Then we'd have refugees that part of the, you, you be coming from a political process that, that you can, this is, this impact health. And then uh, stress that also impact health. Uh, the other uh, factor that is always a component when we are looking at the perspective of global health is the concept of human rights and health. Uh, and, and we have minority rights, no, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, questioning rights, women rights, environmental rights, and then, and then of course, the issue of health. Is health, uh, is health as a human right? Uh, and if we understand that health is a human right, yes, it's the same that clean water, shelter, nutrition, then uh, this is, as you remember, part of the definition is equity in health. And then, of course, there is the issue that um, if health is a human right, uh, access to health is also a human right, and this is a different aspect that we also have to consider. And, uh, and we emphasize to deal with these issues, we don't need to go to a foreign country or a foreign city. Okay, we have a lot of these issues here in, in Jefferson County. Um, then this also brings the, the aspect that, that without saying global health is interdisciplinary, it's multidisciplinary, but it's also beyond health sciences. Uh, and this also brings the point that, that, that if a medical school is going to develop a curriculum for global health, I mean, this is I mean, the basis for this curriculum that has got to be interdisciplinary and, and multidisciplinary. Then these are my 10 minutes of uh, introduction of uh, global health principles. And now Ruth is going to continue uh, discussing one aspect of global health. What are we doing here locally with service and education? And then I'm going to go back to research. Ruth? Thank you. Thank you. So as we start, um, I, I want to uh, just remind uh, the group that we already have a very strong HIV clinic. Um, Dr. Pirani's leadership has really helped maintain this, continue to grow. But we began to see some overlap with our HIV care and people that were coming to the community uh, as part of resettlement. And so we began to think about the relationships that exist and how we provide care so that we can, again, address not only the medical issues, but the many social issues that are involved in their care. Um, so part of our process of global health looks at not only HIV care, but also two additional components that, that focus much more directly on global or international health. That is the vaccine and international travel clinic, and I'll, I'll provide just a little bit of background about that. But I want to focus largely on refugee health and the, the projects that we have going on, just as a demonstration for what exists and the opportunities that are present. Just to kind of give you an idea about the growth in these areas, just looking at the number of patients that have been seen um, since the, the clinic uh, in uh, uh, what was formerly Wings and now is uh, the 550 clinic, that we started with about 150 patients in 94, and 2014 we have close to 1,800 patients. Well, that same sort of growth has happened in two other initiatives in that uh, we began and took over the clinical aspects of the vaccine and international travel clinic from the School of Public Health in uh, uh, mid-2012. Uh, 
And at that time, in the first six months, uh, seven months, we saw about 770 patients. The next seven months, we saw 1,200 patients. The next seven months, were over 1,500 patients. So tremendous growth um, within that, uh, that very small uh, clinic area. When we look at our refugee health um, process, uh, that has grown equally, that when we began uh, to see these refugees just for, Im uh, for immunization uh, services, uh, during our first few months, we saw 800. The next uh, few months, we bumped that up to 1,100. Our most recent data, we've seen over 1,400. So that growth continues. And just as a, as a background, uh, just the difference between uh, an immigrant and a refugee. We're focusing on refugees, and these are people that um, have had to leave their country because of some level of persecution, maybe health, political, social, um, ethnic, or whatever. So I think globally there are about 27 million refugees that are just wandering uh, the, the, the globe, and only about 1% of those will be resettled. Kentucky is viewed as a, pref as a preferred state for resettlement because of the quality health. There are a number of jobs, specifically in manufacturing, and is viewed as a compassionate community. So we expect these numbers to continue uh, because of, of those activities. So I want to just introduce you to the, the Vaccine and International Travel Clinic. Those of you that haven't been there, uh, this is uh, where the magic happens for those that are uh, getting ready to travel internationally. We've changed our focus so that it's much more of an interactive um, counseling type environment. Um, under Don Balcom's leadership, then we, we see patients before they travel, but also we see patients after they travel. This is an example of a couple that came to us, a group of missionaries, went to Zimbabwe, were involved in a home invasion, um, had machetes, uh, uh, attacks uh, going on. They immediately left, came back to us for care um, because they were concerned about exposure and what may have happened to them when they were in Zimbabwe. So our perspective has had to change for vaccine and, and uh, international travel to not only consider the prior travel, the pre-travel counseling, but also what are the needs during the travel and then what needs may occur post-travel. So our, our perspective has certainly expanded with them. Now I mentioned, and I hope you can see other than uh, just the lines, this brings to mind why we need to, to get some help from Carol Hanchett in, in geography. As we're seeing, this is a map, and maybe you can see in the background of the globe, but these lines represent the pathways that our refugees are taking in order to get to the United States. They apply to be part of resettlement through the State Department, but when they're in a country where there is this sort of persecution, they can't leave directly and come to the U.S. So a number of our refugees live uh, for years wandering or in, uh, in camps, refugee camps. So when they get here, they bring a variety of health and social and economic, emotional problems and baggage with them. So just giving you an idea of how desperately the, the transition is from, and the, the uh, pathway is from home countries to the United States. So we get to know these individuals when they come to us um, uh, from a, a health perspective very clearly. Uh, these are just some of the countries where we see our refugees. Our largest group of refugees at this point are Cuban, uh, Nepali, Burmese, um, uh, many from uh, African nations. So our, our need for uh, understanding the population is quite distinct. So when individuals come, uh, they have an overseas medical exam just to make sure that they're not bringing an infectious disease into the country. So uh, upon arrival, uh, they come with just a very little bit of, of information. And we actually became um, acquainted with the Catholic Charities and Kentucky Refugee Ministries because they asked us if, they, if we could help them put together a report about what is the state of health of refugees. So uh, Rebecca Ford helped lead this initiative. We gathered the, the data and quickly saw that there were a number of gaps in what we were understanding and what the needs of this uh, community was and how that may impact the health of, of our communities. One of those involved immunization. So we began to do um, uh, very uh, quickly to provide those vaccines. At the same time, there was a, a need for health screening to get then their initial health visit and gather data and help them get involved in a medical home, in the medical system, 
So we moved quickly from gathering arrival data to providing health screening to providing vaccines, and now we're at the point where we are trying to integrate them into primary care within our system uh, so we can provide then a high-quality ongoing um, uh, medical care home for them. We're also looking at what happens after they leave the office, the, the medical office, and then what happens to them at home, and then how can we support and then really encourage that whole notion of preventive care instead of a simply reactive care. So I just want to introduce you a little bit to what it looks like when we provide services. We actually go to places where it is comfortable for the refugees so we can begin to interact with them in an environment that is comfortable for them. So we try to group as we see people. Uh, we try to group them together according to language. So we have then supports of their community. They are more comfortable and confident then. We can focus on providing um, uh, interpretation on site so that we can really engage with them as we begin to provide their uh, vaccines for them. Uh, we recently uh, were asked to include children because the Jefferson County Public Schools uh, decided to enforce the, the law and say if you don't have your vaccines, you can't come to school. Um, so to keep these children in school, we agreed to help be a safety net for them to provide vaccines while they were waiting for their pediatric examinations. You can tell um, this little girl's really happy. Um, her brother isn't quite so sure about what's going to happen. He just saw something his si uh, sister go through. But... Um, uh, they were, they're excellent, uh, and it's uh, a very exciting involvement. We had to really pull in quickly other disciplines. So we pulled in uh, Dr. Labar and uh, some students from pediatrics to help us ensure that our process was sound, that we had the adult immunization, everybody has an individualized immunization plan. We had to make sure we were doing things correctly uh, with the pediatric patients and were we making sure that we were integrating them into their medical home quickly and appropriately. Uh, so we reached out then and, and extended beyond our knowledge uh, to pull in those um, additional specialties. We have to look at the groups that we're serving. And for example, the Congolese um, is a, a large refugee group, one that we're beginning to see now, where oftentimes it's single head of household, the mom, and many children. So we have to make sure that we have a process for not only understanding their needs, but how can we assure that we are, are maintaining their family unit and then addressing what is important to them to keep them uh, appropriately engaged. Uh, as part of the process, we also are providing school physicals for children. So again, we had to reach out to, you know, med peds and, uh, and the Department of Medicine to help us then figure out what we need to do, how do we do this correctly, uh, adequately, and in a high quality manner uh, for these children. Uh, it requires that we have translators, that we have to have people that understand not only the language and the culture to make sure then that we are doing things correctly and that we are maintaining confidence with this, this community. Uh, we've spent a lot of time then pulling together the many disciplines. The School of Nursing has been uh, critical for us uh, to help um, uh, make sure that we are addressing then individual needs. So how do we assure that early on in clinical practice that we are teaching um, what may be important? For example, this uh, Muslim woman did not want to have her vaccines in the large group uh, in the main room with everyone else. Uh, so uh, we are learning then how to adjust our, our processes accordingly. We are including then students from many different schools. Our students from public health have been primary for us in helping to get this started, but then pulling in uh, groups from uh, the School of Medicine, the Sullivan College of Pharmacy, um, all the local schools of nursing, um, as well as the School of Public Health. We also reached across campuses and we had to say we, with this uh, situation, we have to have a very strong error-proof process. Uh, for example, we had a, a Nepali family, four men, all had the same name, exact same name. Um, in Nepal, uh, the concept of birth date uh, doesn't have meaning. So not only do they have the same name, they all have the same birth date. Everybody's born January 1st. Well, you know, this is an accident waiting, just begging to happen. So we had to really figure out what do we need to do to prevent error from occurring. So using the, the School of Engineering to help us with logistics, um, how can we set this up so uh, that keeps us from, from uh, um, uh, hurting our patients? And then how do we make sure then that we can set this up in a system that runs smoothly, that's able to see about 100 refugees every session? And that's what we see now, uh, 100 um, adults and children um, in about a four or five hour time frame. Uh, they may get up to, uh, the, the adults may get up to four vaccines at any one setting, the children may get seven. 
So how do we do this and keep everybody safe requires a great deal of coordination and it requires that everybody understand their role and uh, their responsibilities. So in order for this to happen then, we have to have not only engagement of the patient, and I think that's the true lever for us as clinicians. How do we engage our patients effectively? But how do we then do so within the, the med medical education process? So how do we, we make sure that we are identifying the strengths in all of our health sciences, and, as well as those that extend beyond our traditional campus, so we can work together to better understand um, and, and get this well-oiled oiled machine to move even more effectively. So in order to do that, we have to have a very strong focus, not only on clinical practice, but there has to be a strong focus on education. And that education has to be interprofessional. That means we have to pull together the many groups um, to work together. Now, the World Health Organization has said, you know, you've got to pull together groups, and it has to start at the student um, level. And we know then that from our perspective, for these, um, these uh, um, uh, refugee health activities, we have to have strength in not only medicine, nursing, public health, and pharmacy, just from the medical side. So we have to make sure then that those, their, the capabilities, the ability to take that knowledge and put it into action, that competent practice um, has to be a strength. And in order to do that, then we, we've gone to the literature to say, what are we learning regarding interprofessional practice? And what are the expectations? What are those competencies that need to be present? We have a list that have come from an expert panel, a, collabor a collaborative that resulted uh, with a push from the Institute of Medicine in, in uh, uh, 2011 that outlined what the competencies need to be for interprofessional practice. How do we get groups to work together, understand different roles, support each other, know who has strengths in, in certain areas, um, focus on uh, where we know our weaknesses are, and uh, then come together and learn to work together as teams uh, more effectively. So we have approached this from an educational perspective. Now, I don't expect you to see this, but it just really is a demonstration that we looked at each one of those competencies and then said, okay, for medicine, nursing, public health, and pharmacy, how are we going to address these? What needs to be involved if we're saying that this care needs to be patient-centered or it needs to be process-oriented? What's involved in the process for each of these disciplines? So we set up a roadmap then that helped us um, work, take these first steps toward assuring competent practice and the educational platform that needs to be present. So these are just some summaries of pictures we've had pharmacists teaching nurses, physicians teaching pharmacists and nurses, and vice versa, all working together as we develop um, these, these processes. To date, we've given about 8,000 doses of vaccines. We have had, I think, at, at, uh, as we gather our data, we have a continuous uh, improvement model approach. I think we've had six medical errors. Um, for these uh, 8,000, which uh, that's an extremely low rate, but we're not satisfied with six. And these have involved things like maybe giving a varicella vaccine to someone that was immune to varicella. Um, so they have not been um, uh, uh, errors that put patients at risk, but it demonstrated that we still have to continue to move forward with our um, improvement initiatives. So one of the things that we wanted to do also was ask, well, you know, what is the impact on those that are participating? So to give you an idea of the scope of interprofessional participation. We've had students and faculty from ID, PEDS, internal medicine, nursing, public health, pharmacy, and social services. We've had 35 different faculty, 22 residents and fellows, 278 students, 28 support staff, and 16 researchers involved in this, uh, uh, in this initiative. Uh, we, we surveyed initially uh, 200 students and, and 30 faculty. Um, and we had really high levels of reported, not only satisfaction with the process, indicating they had new knowledge, uh, perceiving their ability to use this knowledge in a, in a culturally uh, sensitive and aware um, uh, environment. Uh, everybody, 94% uh, said they learned something new about other participating uh, disciplines. 100% indicated their skill set and competence regarding vaccine handling and administration improved. I think that is uh, tremendous, especially if we look at the number of outbreaks that we currently have that are reported uh, primarily in outpatient settings regarding uh, safe injection practices or the lack thereof. 96% also indicated they found professional value in the opportunity. And I think that's key, that if we are seeing from our students and perspective. If you hit the red button, it disconnects the call. I'm sorry. I was trying to hit the <laughs> mic thing. I should, see, I shouldn't touch anything. Well, that's okay. Just... 
Sounds like a president's office. Yes. Yeah, so. All right, great. <laughs> okay. Well, that's all right. We're gonna we're gonna go we're gonna pretend like we can't hear that, all right? But but we have 96% indicated they found professional value in the opportunity. So I think recognizing that the people that participate feel this is of value, and so we need to continue and uh, and move forward. So I want to turn it back over to Dr. Ramirez to say, all right, well, what are now are the research perspectives and opportunities? Okay. <laughs> Perfect timing. <laughs> then, um, then essentially, uh, as Ruth mentioned, this has been a, a brief, brief overview of all the things that, that, that the group is doing. And this is just the perspective from the uh, refugee health and, and immunization. There is the other perspective of travel medicine and the perspective of, of HIV. Uh, now, in the area of, of research, under this umbrella of global health, uh, uh, these are be the different topics of research. I want to mention that all this is based on this group that we have developed in the, in the division, that is the Clinical Translation Research Support Unit, uh, uh, and these are the, this group of, uh, that we are going to probably introduce this concept to the Department of Medicine soon. Uh, but, but essentially, uh, pneumonia, and all these are linked. Pneumonia and influenza is linked. Uh, tuberculosis, of course, present most of the time as, as pneumonia. We work, we work on, on HIV primarily. In, we have uh, funding in HIV and lung disease. But we are working on MDR-resistant uh, bacteria. There is a work on vaccines in our vaccine uh, uh, clinic. Uh, refugee health, that, I don't know if Ruth mentioned, there is already a database with uh, refugees, and, and there are more than <clears throat> 8,000 uh, refugees in the database. <clears throat> and when we uh, understand there was already some meeting with some groups on the Department of Medicine, because the primary medical problems of refugees continue to be no diabetes, hypertension, the regular uh, uh, internal medicine problems. And then we have work on emerging uh, infectious diseases. As you know, our primary work in the division has been in the area of uh, pneumonia. Uh, and just to give you uh, an idea of where we get uh, funding and what happened with this um, uh, work, um, we have uh, funding from the, from the NIH for some of our pneumonia work as well as uh, HIV. Uh, the CDC that funds some of the work on, on refugees. Uh, the um, Department of Health and Human Services, that is, is we have funding from, from HRSA for our HIV program uh, during the years. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security that we work with the School of Public Health in some issues of influenza and emerging infectious diseases. We have also funding from the Department of Defense and then a lot of funding from uh, industry. Uh, and the group has generated more than 200 peer review publications in the topic of global health. And I'm not going to go through all this, uh, but just to mention that, that, for instance, we all know that our community acquired pneumonia organization, the, the CAPO group. This is, um, we have a lot of countries, we have a large database of community acquired pneumonia. Uh, we are doing research using the, the internet. Uh, this is a, a global research uh, network. Uh, we divided the areas of, of, of pneumonia in according with uh, health practices in US, Canada, Latin America, Europe, and Africa and Asia. And we have several publications from this uh, group. Um, at a certain point, we're looking at in the state of Kentucky, uh, and this was the Severe Influenza Pneumonia Surveillance Project, uh, again, supported by the uh, Department of Homeland Security. The idea was to see what happened with influenza, but also to have a, a survey in Kentucky to define emerging infections. We discussed this in the, in the grant proposal that when you're looking at a new avian influenza virus that may happen any time, and you're looking at a new emerging uh, influenza virus, this is not going to happen. This is going to be persons in contact with animals, persons in contact with birds. This is not going to happen in New York City or San Francisco. It's going to happen in rural America. This is why we say that we need to have surveillance in rural America to be able to identify these uh, emerging uh, uh, pathogens. Um, during the last four years, we've been funded by the CDC for this study that is rapid empiric treatment with oseltamivir study. 
the RETOS study. We'll be using, uh, during the influenza season, we will be enrolling every patient admitted to any one of the uh, hospitals here in Jefferson County. And this has been um, a study that, is, um, that we have still one more year funding. Uh, um, as part of this, we are doing an inflammatory uh, study looking at cytokines, neutrophil functions in pneumonia. Uh, and, and now uh, we are going to start uh, a study that is a population-based study to define clinical economic burden of pneumococcal pneumonia in hospitalized adults in the United States. Now we say United States, but this is a population-based study. We're going to work with Jefferson County. Where we have 750,000 population. Uh, every, every one of these adults get admitted into one of the nine adult hospitals in Jefferson County. Then we are going to have data in all pneumococcal and all serotypes of pneumococci. And through this population, we're going to translate this into the, into the U.S. And has been um, more than 15 years that we don't have an incident study of pneumonia. And we call these hospitalized adults with pneumococcal pneumonia incidence study, the happy study that's going to be going on for the next uh, two years. And I always take the opportunity for any resident that is, wants to participate in research. We are very busy uh, in the division. There's a lot of possibilities uh, to participate uh, in research. Then, um, and, and this is the, the logo of this uh, inhale uh, study, this investigating HIV-associated lung disease. Uh, that, that we are in collaboration with the pulmonary division here looking uh, at pulmonary disease in, in, in our uh, HIV patients. And this is a consortium from the NIH, and these are the, the members of the, of the consortium. This, again, another study that's going to go from the next uh, five years. Then this is just um, to give you a brief overview. Then, of course, uh, as I mentioned, there are vaccine studies. We're working on, on tuberculosis in collaboration with the, also with members of the pulmonary division. We have a, a recent publication looking at risk factors for tuberculosis in hospitalized patients all over the world. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, uh, we continue working on, on, on influenza and emerging pathogens, mostly with uh, Dr. Colleen Johnson from, the, uh, from uh, microbiology. Then, um, to finish, uh, what do we see the next step of this um, uh, initiative? Then at this moment, uh, we are in the 550 clinic, the ambulatory care building in the second floor. We have vaccine and international travel. We have comprehensive HIV medicine, refugee health, civil surgeon designation. This is what Ruth discussed uh, today. Uh, we are going to start with uh, health of Kentucky prisoners through telemedicine. As a matter of fact, we started. Uh, already. Uh, then uh, we are going to, uh, they started this year, uh, we are going to do telemedicine for every prison in Kentucky. Um, then uh, this is, this is uh, the new project for the, for the global health. We are in the second floor. It uh, goes without saying that one thing that is immediate for us is to move, not only, not move, expand our uh, operations to the third floor ACB building that is a space vacant by OBGYN, and, and either we are going to get the space or probably we're just going to move there and take the space. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Dr. Roman is already. <laughs> we are going to send our patients and take the space. <laughs> okay, but this is uh, immediate. We want to go from the second floor and usually go the, to the third floor. Um, and this is going to be uh, what's going to happen tomorrow. Now, what do we see that's going to happen in the next three to five years? What is our plan for global health? And we've been discussing this before. Our plan is we move from the global health clinic to the global health home. Okay, we need to have our own place for global health. We need to have a, a travel, comprehensive HIV, telemedicine, refugee, plus the educational component that Ruth discuss the educational component, but we don't have any more space for any new students or any new person that wants to do uh, research. Then we need to have this. And also with this concept that, that for an HIV patient, for a refugee, for a, 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 the idea is that you need to have the place that you go there is, is home. You just go there to socialize. You want to have your coffee, your tea, uh, and you learn about how to get a driver license. And how to, you, get, you learn about the public library. It's not just medicine. It's not just diagnosis and treatment. It's the, we go back to the initial slide, is the idea of global health approach 
to, um, to uh, medicine. Then this is how we see uh, the future. Then essentially, um, we have uh, give you an overview of what we're doing in global health uh, in the Department of Medicine. Uh, and the primary goal for everybody that works in the clinic and from Ruth and myself was just for everybody in the Department of Medicine to know in my last slide that uh, it's happening here. We have global health in the Department of Medicine. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, people ask me every once in a while and I've given lectures about what do chairs want faculty to do? And, and this is what chairs want faculty to do. They want them to engage and, and expand our possibilities within the community and not ask for much resources for it. Uh, <laughs> but you know, in essence, we have not been able to provide a lot of resources. And yet, see how much can be done just by a little bit of passion and a little bit of organization, and a little bit of a few group of people who are excited about an idea moving into the next level. And uh, I think it was Gandhi who said, there go my people, I follow, for I am their leader. I will end up following them, because they're driving it, and I will have no choice, and we will be better for it. So I urge you to begin to look at possibility for initiatives to do with the Department of Medicine to expand into other areas, interdisciplinary, uh, and beyond uh, our department. Question for you. So many people think of global health as sending someone somewhere else. And today you've only described the aspects of how do we do global health here. Are you thinking at some point to expand where you now have people that you ship over to address issues elsewhere? Is that part of the vision of the global health initiative? I think, you know, certainly we want to we want to maximize how do we help people provide care in our community using our resources and, and understanding our population. So what we do best is pulling those resources together locally. Is it is this where global health is going in many other institutions? It certainly is. But I think our approach also is to let's kind of develop that barrier blindness and, and make sure that we don't say you we only provide activities overseas, but that we're teaching and supporting what this means to you as being part of a community. So is that out of the question? Absolutely no. In fact, a, a number of, of schools currently have very active programs to send people abroad. But I think also as we, as we teach our students, we, we're, we're going to have students that either can't afford to do that, um, they have family obligations. So we don't want to prevent them from being involved in global health activities simply because they can't go somewhere else. Um, and practice happens here. So how do we make sure then that they understand what that means to their practice and start it at, a, at an early level, at the student level, so that they learn to work together, they understand the cultural issues, all the social determinants of health, what that means to their individual practice. So as they develop their skills in, in medicine and patient care uh, to show them that they can do it here, and then they learn the local and available resources. From, oh. No, no, say no, from, from a humanitarian point of view, is, is, you raise very important for, for physicians to face what happened in other countries. Uh, but, but from the school point of view, you read in the literature, it has been very difficult for schools to develop an organized curriculum for a person that is going to a different place to have the competencies, okay, what are you going to gain when you go there? Besides going there and getting 25 pictures. Then it's, this is the second aspect, but this has to be very well organized at the, at the school level. We are not there yet. Even though we have collaborations with our pneumonia, we have collaborations in so many countries, and we, can, we have contacts, but we think that we need to probably develop this first and then move in. Questions? Let's start behind you and then you. Let me just make a comment. My name is Austin, so I'm a PYM colleague. I really don't belong here. <laughs> but I Uh, the larger uh, universities, very 
Very good. Yes, definitely. You know, you know, I think that this really br brings home a point that, w that we recognize that we are working on, and that is how do we actually know what is happening across not only the health sciences, uh, but beyond with respect to global health activities. So our desire is to try to develop a process to catalog not only activities, but interests, and then find, you know, who has resources, who needs resources, you know, how do we then uh, develop that kind of synergy? And we've reached out recently to the, the College of Business because we know that, um, that there are a number of opportunities that may actually emerge from the business side in helping us understand, um, you know, how we kind of move outside of ourselves as part of interprofessional and multidisciplinary approaches um, to get to new, uh, new aspects that may help us then with funding and to do those very things that that you're talking about. So I think right now we're even looking at developing a, 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 a global health symposium where we'll have a day where we can gather people together that are involved in international activities to come and tell us what you're doing. What are you doing? Where, where do you see this going? You know, what do you need to have happen? And then we can share what we what currently exists. Like for example, in the in the clinic we have, you know, Yvette that you know speaks five languages. We have uh, you know a lot of Spanish speaking um, uh, yeah, practitioners. We have um, including myself. Including I, them. Speak yeah, one language. I speak Kentucky. Yeah. So I speak so, Spanish. You speak Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I'm the I'm the comic relief for the refugees because I will try to speak their language and it you know I, I'm mutilated unfortunately. But you know we have a lot of these resources, but we're not really good about stepping out and demonstrating what we have and what we can do and yeah. and therefore how we can share them. Any other comments or questions on the, okay, thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't see you. Yes, we are, we are, uh, uh, we already uh, incorporated this uh, because there was some discussion with uh, Paula, uh, Dr. Pirani and Yes. Essentially, at this moment, the rotation is the 550 clinic with everything that goes around the 550 clinic. Uh, probably the resident, uh, then we're having more and more residents uh, and students. But yeah, we welcome you to the, you know, those that are interested in travel medicine, you know, to come and kind of see what our approach is. Um, we get, we've are already getting requests from residents who have left. Uh, now attendings in other states that are saying, you know, I'm interested in setting up a travel medicine clinic here. Can you share what you've done? And we, of course, willingly share, you know, all, our entire operational manual, policies and procedures, examples of what we do, um, so we can continue then th um, this growth. So we want to do that because we know when we make things better in Louisville, we make things better outside of Louisville. So it's got to start here. Um, I love this. We tried to get Dr. Mears to say it's actually happening here, um, just to say that yes, you know these activities are um, are really going on and uh, and growing quickly. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.